just to wake you up a little bit. Good to have you here this morning. Uh, we we're blessed to uh, be able to come together on Sunday morning and worship. And, uh, you know, as our week, looks like the sun's coming out. Wow, that's even better. As our weeks come and go, you know, things happen, and, and we're always thankful to see God's faithfulness. And I just want to uh, pray this morning for uh, Steve Rose, who attends here. Uh, he had a stroke on the way to work the other day, and uh, so he's up in uh, intensive care at St. Luke's, and uh, there, it's a real touch-and-go situation. And so just to be praying for him and Ann, uh, just a great couple, and uh, just uh, it's kind of scary time. So uh, just praying for the doctors so that they'd be able to figure out what to do because it's a real touchy situation where this has taken place. So uh, let's just open with a word of prayer this morning. Father, we come before you... <clears throat> And we're so grateful that uh, you hear our prayers. You care about every single thing in our lives. There's nothing that escapes you. You are, you are a great and faithful God. And Father, I know so many here this morning have things on their heart, uh, things they've been praying for and things they're concerned about. And, and uh, everything from anxieties to, uh, uh, to just you name it. And so God, we're so thankful that we can come before you that you care. And you want us to bring our request to you because you are a God of the impossible. What seems impossible to men is not impossible to you. What seems and is out of our reach is not out of your reach because, fathers, your word tells us there isn't a bird that falls to the ground that you don't know about. Uh, you are aware of all things and you are a sovereign God. You are a good God and a faithful God. You are a God who answers prayers. So, Father, we just come before you this morning again on behalf of the roses and I ask that you would help them and help Steve and, and uh, just uh, the doctors working with them, the nurses, uh, God, that, uh, that he would make it through this time. And, and Father, we just, uh, just lift them up and others this morning who couldn't be with us. And uh, Father, what a privilege it is to come together on a Sunday morning and praise you and worship you for the great God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in Thessalonians and we're in the fifth chapter and we started the first part of the, the, the study last week, and we're going to kind of deal with the second half this week, and uh, dealing with the brothers in Thessalonica, and uh, it's a great letter because it's filled with so much truth and so much treasure and so many wonderful promises. So uh, last week we talked a little bit about uh, the times. He started out in verse 1, now brothers, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Uh, part of the, the, the reason Paul was writing was uh, the Thessalonians believed that the, the rapture had taken place, the, the snatching away, the catching up of the church. And so they thought that they were going to be in the tribulation. And so there were concerns. And so Paul wrote to them saying there's dif different things that are going to happen uh, and educated them as to what was going to happen. So they shouldn't be worried about it, that uh, there were people spreading false rumors, which uh, we have today as well. And then the second part, uh, I talked about the light in uh, verse 4. But brothers, you are not in darkness, so that, you sh so that the day should not surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled, for those who are asleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation and a helmet. So, so he was saying that uh, because they had light, they walked in light, they understood the truth, they didn't need to be concerned, but he was uh, encouraging them, exhorting them to put on this breastplate, uh, which uh, Paul, using military terms, was that would protect them from the neck to their vital organs and a helmet. Uh, and so these two uh, aspects of military uh, clothing, warfare, protection, would protect them inwardly and outwardly. So uh, his exhortation for that was a key. And then we move into uh, uh, verse 11 where he talked about, because of these things, encourage one another, build each other up. Uh, just in fact, as they were doing. Fortunately, the Thessalonian church was a very healthy church, and they were doing lots of great things. Their testimony was being spread throughout the world because of them, and great things were happening. So today we're going to look at uh, the third point, and this is dealing with verses 12 through the end of 
the chapter. And these are some great verses because there's all these exhortations and all these things that are going to help us. You know, the, the Bible is a story. It's God's story and how it unfolds and his plans for us. And all the way along through this story, he gives us exhortations and, and points us in the right direction. It's a, the Bible is a love story. It's also a, a war story. Guys love war movies, don't we? We like action and all kinds of things like that. The chase scenes, you know, the, the typical saying is, let's just cut to the chase. You know, let's just get to the chase. You know, that's, when I go to movies, I don't care about all the other stuff. It's I want the action. I want the chase scenes, you know. And so the Bible is full of chasings, if you would, of, of exhortations as to what's going to happen and the times that they're living in. And so it's a wonderful uh, book to read. It's not just a, a book of do's and don'ts, but it is God's story, his history being unfolded before us. And we have the privilege of being able to look back at the Old Testament and look forward in prophecy. And he touches on prophecy, and we'll be talking more about that today as well. But it is really an exciting letter because it is full of action. God asks and wants us to be involved in this great journey called life. It's an epic journey. And each and every one of us in this room is a story that is God-honoring. And it is a story in which God is working in your life right now, this morning, right here. And he's in this process of unfolding it as we go along. So we can truly be excited about tomorrow. There is hope for tomorrow. I even know there may be times that we're going through the storms, uh, like the song that Dallas uh, was leading us in about the, being in the storms of life, and, and boy, the ship is rocking back and forth and up and down, and, and uh, we're, we're in all these uh, difficult times, but God is going to get us through these storms in life, one way or another. And so to be able to have the right attitude in the storms of life is essential. So we're going to look at that starting in verse 12. And this is, he's starting here talking about the significance of uh, the brothers in Christ respecting their leaders, respecting the leadership. Verse 12 in uh, chapter 5. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you and are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other, and we urge you, brothers, and warn those who are idle among you to encourage the timid, to help the weak, to be patient with everyone. So he gives these exhortations. He said, he talks about those who are working hard and, and uh, those like Paul came in and Paul was always being careful not to take advantage of the people he was ministering to. So a lot of times Paul uh, supported himself. But he talks about this idea of, of loving uh, and showing support and respect for their work, uh, to live in peace. And he goes, I urge you and warn brothers, those who are idle, Encourage the timid. And the, the idea here, timid in the Greek, has an idea of being short in soul. That's what it refers to. Short in soul is someone who, who needs encouragement. And we all have people among us and in our, in our lives that they just need encouragement. If you ask the average person uh, who's just going through life, we all need that encouragement, don't we? They say for like every, every negative thing you say to your child, you need a minimum of 10 or 20 positive things to build them up. We tend to always remember the negative, don't we? I mean, someone can say 100 great things to you, and someone says one thing, it's a zinger. Man, that really gets you. So this exhortation, we need that in the body of Christ. We need to be encouraged to continue to keep moving forward in life, even in the, the storms of life. So he goes on to say here in the idea of helping the weak and be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. There's a lot of times where we want our pound of flesh in a situation we maybe feel we were treated unfairly or being treated unjustly. And one of the concerns that Paul had with, with the Thessalonians as well as us is that we don't get involved with trying to get back at somebody or, or have revenge, uh, but to, uh, to realize that that will consume us. When we allow bitterness or anger or hatred in our lives and we don't deal with it, it will consume you like an acid. It just eats away your guts. It eats away at your insides. And so one of the exhortations Paul is saying, is, look, in order for you to stay healthy and keep moving forward, don't be, get involved in paying people back. Ultimately, God is a just God. God takes care of everything. Nothing escapes the hand and the eye of God. Nothing escapes. So he's in the process. And, and you know, like we sin in life and our sins are forgiven. We know that Christ paid the price for our sins. 
But you know, there's consequences. When we sin against God and each other, there are consequences. Yes, there's forgiveness, but there's consequences. And boy, the consequences sometimes are pretty painful, and they don't just go away. Sometimes those consequences uh, last for life. I had a friend I grew up with, and uh, we used to hop trains. Okay, kids, turn tune out on this one. We used to hop on trains when they'd be going through West Dallas, and we'd ride the trains out to wherever and jump off. Well, he didn't get off one time, and the train ran over, and he lost a leg, and it was amputated up right here. So he was uh, in bad shape. So the consequences of hopping trains didn't pay off. So, uh, so, you know, we thought it was great until, you know, the saying is it's always fun until somebody gets hurt. You know, yeah. And so the consequences sometimes in life will leave us scarred. And, but, you know, thank God for his mercy and grace. So anyway, he goes on to say here that um, he, he makes this statement, nobody pay back anybody for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and uh, this, is, this is what I kind of call the mini beatitudes in Scripture. And then he talks about this idea of being kind. Have you found it, yeah, and maybe it's just me, that in the world we're living in today, are, is the world short on kindness? Yeah, yeah, we probably would all agree with that. And if you've ever been in that, in that place where you need someone to demonstrate kindness to you, that's huge. That's huge. And so part of the church is to, we are to be those who are showing kindness to others. And, and not just when we think they deserve it. You know, it's hard to be kind to people when they're not necessarily being kind back to you or gracious to people when they are very ungracious people. But this is where the Spirit of God can only, it's only through the Spirit of God we have the ability and the capacity to do these things. We can't do it humanly in ourselves. We can't. So that's where the power of the Holy Spirit and God comes in in our lives where he gives us his grace to be able to be kind. And... Uh, Boy, I'll tell you, it, it is something that, like I said, as I look around the world and see and interact with people, the lack of kindness, the lack of kindness, it's just something that I believe is a manifestation of the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. And then he goes on to say here, uh, over on 16, and I just love this, he's, he talks about be joyful. Again, he's saying be joyful, act on this. Be joyful always in always. So this idea of being joyful is something that we're not talking about science fiction here, that, that there's a, God gives us a capacity supernaturally to be joyful even in those difficult times. And you've all been there. You've been in those times where, where things are very difficult and yet God somehow gives you an ability to have a joy and a peace in those situations. And it's one of the shortest, this verse here is one of the shortest verses in the New Testament. It's just two words in the Greek. This idea of, of joyful, joyfulness, being joyful, always, very important. Here's a few things that uh, I love these verses. It talks about, uh, may the joy, of the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. James, and I, in the book of James, I love this, in the first chapter, he talks about this idea of being joyful in situations when you find yourself in very, very difficult situations that you are to be joyful. And he says, he says this for the fact that as he goes on further in James to verse 3 and 4, he talks about the idea that this is God's will for you, that when you fall into this, these various trials and temptations and struggles, that, that God is there to meet you there. And it is only through the resistance of those difficult times that God builds the character in our lives. Character is not built in uh, laying on your back in bed or or laying in a lawn chair or a hammock or whatever. Character is not built in those situations. It's when things are really hard that that character that God is building in your life, you find a supernatural strength and grace in those times. And it's a total dependence upon God. So this being kind is a total dependence on God. And, and it's demonstrating the graciousness of Christ himself because that's what really the fruits of the Spirit are. They truly are the very, the very character of Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit being manifested in us so that we can share those with others. Does that make sense? So as God, the Spirit, Holy Spirit within us, is we're pouring out these graces that God supernaturally has given us. And that's when you see the, what really we're made of as believers in Jesus Christ is when, when you're in a situation that doesn't maybe make sense and God has given you the strength and power, that's when great things, great things happen. So being joyful always, always. Then he says uh, in 17, be prayerful, 
continually. Pray continually. So this is, this is a, this tremendous strength and power in this idea of praying continually. In the Greek, what it means is to have a hacking, uncontrollable cough. Ever been around somebody who has a cough they can't control? Tracy Ben, I was in my office, I was studying this, I think a week or so ago, and she was really, she couldn't stop coughing. She was wheezing and gagging, and we were glad when she left. Um, <laughs> just kidding. But, but she had this cough, and, and yeah, 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 Tr- Tracy's here. Thanks for coming back. Um, but, but, but you know, like when you've just got a cough, you just can't stop coughing. That's the idea of prayer continually. It's, it's something that we're continually offering up to God. So in this exhortation, again, we're to be kind, we're to be joyful in circumstances, but also we are to be praying continually for others. Uh, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I just start praying. Uh, that's normally a good way to fall asleep, is you just start praying, or you drive in the car, or you've had those situations where somebody, maybe God just put somebody on your heart at a particular time, and you just feel like, I really got to pray for that person, or, or I don't know why I feel I need to pray for them, and you just, God just moves within you to pray for that person in that particular place, and uh, man, I'll tell you, I've had that experience so many times in my life where then later you hear about someone, they'll call and say, this was going on, and you're like, whoa, I, was, I had a burden to call you or pray for you. And, and I do that a lot of times when God puts someone on my heart, I'll call you in the church, someone or, or, or whatever. I'll go out of my way to contact them because I just feel like this heavy burden. That's the Holy Spirit. That's God working in you. Next, verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances. Hey, that's, that's tough. And again, that's going back to James and he's talking about in all circumstances, God is doing something whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, God is always in the process of working in our lives. It's just like breathing. You cannot exist without breathing. Try it. You know, just like hold your breath for 15, 20 minutes, see what happens. You, you will be blue. Uh, but the reality is this, is, is it's so much a part of our life that we are, we are to be joyful and to be praying continually, but to giving thanks in all circumstances. And you may say, well, that's completely insane. I can't give thanks in this particular situation. Well, we never know that in those crisis times of our lives, what God is not only doing in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. And so that's so many times the, the old saying, there's more that's caught than taught. Have you ever experienced that? There's more that's caught than taught. So how you're living your life and what you're doing and what you're, you're, you're experiencing is so, so important that you don't have any idea how that's affecting others. My father-in-law was on the Fire Prevention Bureau <clears throat> in Chicago, and uh, he you know, would uh, uh, make sure all the, a lot of the high-rises were safe. And he used to write up City Hall, and they would get crazy with him because he would be writing up tickets for City Hall, and, and they would challenge him. And one of the things, they, his, they would say, Halloran, you obviously don't want to be promoted anymore in the fire department, do you? Because he, he did what was right. And he said, I'm responsible for the safety of these people. And he, had a, he was a man of character, <clears throat> and I really admired him for that. And then one, one year, they were, the firemen were striking, and he, uh, he wouldn't strike. He stayed at the firehouse. And he had death threats and people broke windows in his car and everything. And, and his, his philosophy was, I am not going to leave the city unprotected. My calling to be a fireman is greater than what I think I need to have in my finances or whatever. And I respected him for that. We visited him at, visited him at the firehouse when he was doing that, and, and I always admired that. But so it's doing the right things in all times, but, but I can be thankful for the fact that he was a man of character. We all have people in our lives who, who did the right things and paid the price, people who stood for what was right, and they paid a price. And so that's what I believe he's talking about. In the midst of circumstances, the difficulty, Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Get used to it. Get, and if you're not used to it, get used to it because it's going to happen. We're moving in that direction in the world we're living in today. Then he goes on to say here, and I love this, this is God's will for you. This is God's will for you. These things in Christ Jesus. And you know what? To be in Christ and walking with Christ is the safest place on earth. Yeah. 
It's the safest place on earth. When I am seeking the Lord God with all my heart, all my soul, when I'm seeking him in the good times and the bad times and the difficulties, when he is at the very center of my life, it's the safest place on earth to be. We have people who've been in dangerous places. We've got uh, some missionaries with us right now who are coming and going. The Everlines are going to be here in a couple weeks sharing. And he's got a pastor friend from Argentina who's going to be here sharing in Sunday school. So we're going to be in here that day. Uh, and he's going to share, and Jim will interpret. He doesn't speak much English. But just to hear some of their stories of what God has done and doing in their lives is so exciting to see uh, people who are putting themselves in dangerous, dangerous places and in difficult situations that see are seemingly impossible. One of the things Jim did back, oh man, 30 years ago, there was a huge earthquake in Mexico City. Jim was in charge of organizing all the Christian organizations in Mexico City to help uh, provide relief for people in the earthquakes, digging people out of collapsed buildings and things like that. That was just one of the things Jim has done over the years is coordinating all these relief efforts in these countries when they've had disasters. So he's been there, done it, got the t-shirt, and so I'd encourage you to come out to hear him and his friend. Anyway, a little commercial there. But the reality is, I just love the fact that God's will for us is to seek him. And so whatever comes upon us, whatever happens to us, we're the center of God's will. We, we, we can know where we're exactly where he wants us to be, and if that means our life ends here or our life ends there or we find ourselves in a difficult situation, you know, that's where it is, and, and God gives us this grace. So then he goes on to say here, and I just love this, verse 19, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. And I just love it. Here's a few things that I just wanted to share about the Holy Spirit this morning. Number one, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an it or a thing. He's part of the triune God. He exists as a person. So the Holy Spirit was involved in writing the scriptures. So as, as the authors wrote, God led them through the Holy Spirit what to write. So the scriptures are inspired. The Holy Spirit came and, with, and dwelt and led those individuals writing the scriptures, number one. Number two, we cannot understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. So number two, well, number one, he wrote the word. Number two, we cannot understand scripture without him. And, and I would say this, if you're grieving the Holy Spirit of God, it's going, to be, it's going to affect your ability to interpret the scriptures accurately. Because we have people all over the world, all kinds of professional Christians today who are distorting the word of God. They distort the word of God, and that's a very dangerous thing. Next, we cannot apply the word of God and have that reality in our lives without the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is central to our Christian life and walk. If we don't understand the Holy Spirit, if we don't seek to know the Holy, how the Holy Spirit works, the fire is going to go out. And, and, and I'm going to read some things here, the significance of the fire and the reference to the fire. But these are just a few things. He wrote the word. He helps us to understand the word, and he empowers us to apply the word to our lives. So how important is that? That's huge. That's huge. And so, and I remember as being a, a Christian, when I first got saved, I, people warned me, no, don't get too much of the Holy Spirit stuff, you'll go crazy. You know, like there were people that were like, well, you know, there's, and there's extremes. There's, you know, there's extremes of, of uh, distortion of, of, of a worship of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is always to point us back to Christ and God the Father. That's what's significant about the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not about him getting any of the glory. It's all about the Holy Spirit pointing to Jesus, and Jesus points to the Father. And so we see this understanding of, of the unfolding of the truth in the authority of God and the authority of Scripture. That's all the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's an author named Henry Blackaby, and uh, he's, he wrote a book years ago called Fresh Encounter. And I love the book because what he says in the book is this. Anything you, we think we know or we understand is a gift given to us by God through the person of the Holy Spirit. Anything you know at all about the Bible is a gift. So there should never be any arrogance in the church of Jesus Christ about what we know or what we perceive we know of the things of God. Arrogance is death. Pride is death. So when we understand it's all a gift from God and boy, how fortunate are we to have this as our God with his word and with the person of the Holy Spirit? Wow, isn't that amazing? Because there's people out there who don't have any of this. They don't have any of this. And they're lost. I mean, they are lost. So this brings us, let's move along here. He talks about this idea of, of uh, not putting out the Spirit's fire. Let me just read a couple things here. 
just bear with me. Um, and these are just from a study uh, I, I, I got. In the, anyway, the Bible describes God as a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. So it's not surprising that fire appears to be a symbol of God's presence. The burning bush, Shekinah, his Shekinah glory, Ezekiel's vision. Um, and so we see in the Old Testament lots of pictures of fire and the significance of fire and God. Uh, next we see uh, fire was important in the Old Testament sacrifices. The fire on the altar for the burnt offering was a divine gift, very important, having been lit originally by God. Levit Leviticus 9.24, God charged the priest with keeping his fire lit. Isn't that interesting? Leviticus 6.13, and made it clear that any fire from any other source was unacceptable. So what I'm saying here is this. In the Old Testament, God gave this gift of fire for the burning of the altar for sacrifices. That's Old Testament. But there's a significance in the fact when God brings the fire, when he talks about here, Paul said, don't put out the Spirit's fire. This is an important statement because we can put out the Spirit's fire. And we think, well, what does that look like? Well, we're going to get there. Uh, just bear with me. But it, it's something, for me, I like to explain it as, is this uh, passion because that's part of what I believe God brings is presence brings passion. If you have absolutely no passion for God and walking with God, there's something wrong. I mean, if you had a hot water heater and there was no fire under that hot water heater and you didn't have hot water, what would you do? You'd figure out why you didn't have fire under the hot water heater to create hot water, right? It's the same thing with us. The Christians, you know, we're, we're lukewarm or we're cold or whatever, or, you know, hot or cold, or Scripture says don't be in between. Um, but this idea here, and we'll look at this just for a second here. Let me just uh, run over here. Okay, I'll go to this. Fire is a wonderful picture of the Holy Spirit's work. The Spirit of God is like a fire, at least in three different ways. He brings God's presence, the picture of God's presence, God's passion, and God's purity. Fire is one of the things that well, you've seen the experience or, or you've seen the uh, pictures of, you know, uh, removing the dross from gold, you heat it up, and, the, and the, the impurities rise to the surface, and they scrape it off the surface. This is part of the Christian life, is God's removing the dross from our lives. So sometimes things are getting really hot in your life, and what he's doing is scraping off the impurities from your life. And that's a gift from the Holy Spirit, and I'm thankful for that. What I, what, when, I got, when I became a Christian, I, was, I had a pretty wild lifestyle, but when I became a Christian, it was amazing. Immediately, the Holy Spirit began to convict me of things in my life to stop doing this. And it, was, it wasn't like a bondage kind of conviction, like, well, you can't ever have fun as a Christian ever again. You can't ever uh, enjoy life because you're this Christian. It was a removal of all the sinful things and sinful thoughts, and he continues working on me and all of us. But there was a joy and a freedom that I now had in my life that was unlike anything else. That to say that living a holy life is the best life ever, living a holy life seeking God, you have more fun than you do as an unbeliever, it's true. It's true. I, I stand and testify to that. I have more fun and I enjoy life more as a Christian than I ever did before I was a Christian. And that's the truth. And I, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm known for having a good time and uh, my wife is too. My, my uh, Marianne is just a lot of fun to be with. She's got a great sense of humor and it's based on the person of Christ. It's based on a walk with him and seeking holiness because as we seek to become more like Christ and he's, we're allowing him to tr transform our lives Incredible things are happening. And he goes on to say here, um, uh, the Holy Spirit creates a passion for God in our hearts. After two traveling disciples uh, saw the resurrected Christ, they described their hearts as burning within us, Luke 24, 32. That they, they said they sensed, talking to Jesus, that there was something burning within them, a passion, a zeal, a, an excitement. And boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing like uh, seeking God and, and seeing God work in your life and in affecting people's lives around you. That's the greatest joy ever. But anyway, we're going to move on here. Um, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. I mentioned last week, a third of the Bible are prophecies. And prophecies are very important that we understand that God's not only telling us about how, how, how people lived and how we're to live today, but what's going to happen in the future. And prophecy is very interesting because Prophets, people were told, if you're a prophet, you're not telling the truth. Just take them out and kill them. 
Okay, no in between, no dancing around. If we did that today with a lot of people on TV, there wouldn't be many people on TV. I'm just keeping it real here. They'd all be dead if we were to base things on the scriptures. I'm just keeping it real. Because here's the thing, prophecy had to be proven or you would be put to death. And one of the ways they did that, there were near prophecies and far prophecies. They would prophesy and it would take place. The far prophecy was future. We're dealing with a lot of far prophecies because Christ, when he was crucified, fulfilled over 300 plus prophecies that were prophesied about him. So prophecies are very important. And so he was warning them, don't disrespect prophecies. Honor those who are speaking the truth. Study these things, learn these things. Then he goes on to say here, test everything is it true, okay, uh, that we refer to the Bereans and the church of the Bereans? They were people who, they took the scriptures and they heard what was said and they compared what they heard to the scripture. Is this truth? And, uh, and, and that's a very important aspect today. Um, Bible interpretation gets a lot of, a lot of people, there's exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is the Greek where we get the word exit. We get, we take out of the scripture what the scripture has to say, the original intent written in the context to the audience in its day. And then, of course, we can make applications today, but there are things written in the Old Testament to Israel that don't apply to us today. So very important we understand that. But, but what Paul is saying here is, look, test to make sure these things are true. If they're not true, run from these heresies. Uh, you need to be concerned. Test everything to see if it's true. Hold on to what is good. Here again, these are all action words. Hold on to what is good. And so, so test the prophecies, make sure this is truth, and what you know to be true, hang on to that, cling on to it like, like, you, like your very life depends upon it. Number 22, verse 22, avoid every kind of evil. Run, don't fool around with it, don't play around with it, and that's where we get into trouble. You know, uh, Psalm 1 talks about the different aspects of blessed is the man who walks, sits, stands, uh, this whole idea of, of, um, of, of things beginning to slowly get a hold of us. It's one thing to just look at something, then it's another thing to stand, and then it's another thing to sit. By the time you get to sitting, you're done, you're gone. It's gotten a hold of you. Whatever that temptation is or whatever that evil is, by the time you're now sitting, you're in trouble. So the idea is if, if you, you know, to look and then to keep moving. And so this is the exhortation he's saying here is, if there's evil... You run from it. Don't think you can handle it. Don't think you can fool around with it. You need to run from it. How many people have, have fallen into horrendous, terrible troubles because they didn't run from something? They, when they should have ran, they should have just shaken the dust off their feet and got out of there as fast as they could. I've had a few situations in my life where I've gotten into these situations, and man, I ran when I was working in Chicago. Uh, there were different situations. Man, I, I, like, I'm out of here and uh, we were sent uh, one time to sent into the Caprini Green in Chicago. You know where Caprini Green is? Not a nice area to do work. And I mean, it was a very, very dangerous place. And I remember, I remember we pulled up in the vehicle. We were supposed to do some work on this place. And uh, we, uh, we looked around. We looked at each other. And was like, there's no, there's no way we're going to make it out of here alive. We had all this equipment and money on us. So we called the boss and said, hey, look, you could send your sons down here to do the work. We're not doing it. And uh, anyway, uh, he didn't send his sons either. But it was one of those scary things where it's like, there's no, you know, you, there is no way I'm going to go in that circumstance, that situation. There's just times where you got to say, I got to do what's right. And I'm not going to danger myself or my family or my character or my integrity in a situation. So run from that. And then he goes on to say here, 23, and I just love this. May God himself the God of peace, he is the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is all in worship. This is all in worship to God. And this is Paul, Paul writing to the Thessalonians. He's laying it all out right now. He is laying it all out right now. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ has done everything on Calvary's cross, so we have everything we need to equip us to live this life. But he's, he's saying this, make sure that every part of your being is in check with who God is. And here's one of the key statements, and I just love this. I read this. Paul knew his personal insufficiency and God's sufficiency. Okay? 
Paul said, I understand my complete insufficiency as a human being, but because of that, I look to Christ, who is my perfect sufficiency. So my question is to us this morning, is that true of us? Are we looking to him to be our all-sufficient God and Savior, empower, equipper, guide, uh, protector of all things? And see, when we understand that he is all and we are nothing, it's all about him, it's not about us. It's he who has redeemed us and he who has saved us and it is he who has kept us and it is he who will deliver us from the wrath to come and he will save us from the, the emptiness and the pits of hell to take us and put us into a position of seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We're there right now. And we have this promise as being adopted as sons, adult sons with all the rights of an adult child. Very important, very key. So he goes on to say this, and I'll close with this. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. We're not going to do that this morning. But, that's, but it's interesting in other countries, that's a very common way to greet each other. Um, I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. So I'm being faithful to read this letter to you that Paul told those in Thessalonica to read this letter. I'm reading this letter to you like a couple thousand years letter. And then he goes on to say here, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So I'm going to just make the transition right now to, as we think about these things, to communion. I think it's a great, a great way to end this morning's time together is to go have communion and to spend just a few minutes thinking about what this means to us, the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ, the price that was paid on Calvary so that we could have all of God's heavenly blessings poured upon us, the manifestation of the grace of God, the Holy Spirit, the gift that we have in this dispensation, this age that we're in, we call the church age right now, we have a couple thousand years where the Holy Spirit empowers us. But during the other parts of history, future, the Holy Spirit's taken out of the, off the earth in a sense that we know him and the way he works. So we have this privilege in the few years that we have left to walk with him. So as the gentlemen come forward let's uh, with the elements, I'm just going to pray. Father, as we prepare our hearts to thank you and praise you for the great God you are, Father, I just pray that we would spend a few moments this morning just wallowing in your grace and mercy, just being able to be so thankful for what you accomplished on Calvary's cross once and for all, the death, burial, and resurrection. The sin issue was dealt with once and for all. Your, you were, your wrath was perfectly satisfied with the sinless, perfect blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we spend a few moments thinking about that, preparing to take the elements, God, we pray you would just move within our hearts in Christ's name.